In 2019, I suffered a catastrophic back injury. For four years, I suffered from severe intermittent back pain until I learned how to fix it. But then, in less than a month, I went from barely being able to touch my knees, barely being able to play drums at all, to being able to play drums 10 hours a day, no problem. If you're a musician who's suffering and you wanna learn how to fix your pain, whether it's wrist, elbow, shoulder, neck, back, hip, or knee pain, then you need to watch every single second of this entire video. I'm obviously a drummer. I have a small drum tracking studio here in San Diego where I track myself and other drummers, but I'm also an 11 year critical care RN. ICU trauma mostly, and previously I had degrees in kinesiology and nutrition. I've had a lot of accidents in my time, as I told you about previously. You know, I was one of those rough and tumble kind of kids. But when I was 28 years old, I was riding my bicycle down beautiful Mission Boulevard here in San Diego, and I got hit by a car. And that is where my, what would become chronic pain, really first started. After recovering from the acute pain, I went back to a normal life. I'd have good days, I'd have bad days, but I was in great shape, and I never stopped working out, and I never stopped eating healthy. But over time, this nagging pain started to become worse and more frequent. So I tried all kinds of protocols and regimens and machines to help me out. I got things like one of those teeter-totters where you hang upside down and it helps stretch out your back. I got various percussion massagers. I even got a reverse hyper machine that I put in the living room of my house. And if I did all of my exercises every single day, I would feel great and have no pain and live a perfectly normal life. But if I missed even one day for any reason at all, the next day when I woke up, I was hurting bad. During a particularly good stretch of weeks, I decided to sit down and learn some new tunes on drums. So I spent an entire day, about 10 hours, playing drums, learning some new stuff. And when I was done, what happened to me is something that I will never, ever forget for the rest of my life. I remember it like it was yesterday. As I got up from my drum stool, I stepped on one of the legs of my hardware that was holding one of my floor toms. I kind of lost my balance a bit, recovered. As soon as I took my next step, I felt the most incredible, breathtaking pain I have ever experienced in my life. It was like getting kicked in the groin, but with a knife, but in my left lower back. I immediately took a step forward and went face first into my bed. But me being me, I didn't think too much of it. I took some ibuprofen, I did a couple of exercises, went on the reverse hyper, and then laid down and went to sleep. The next morning, I opened my eyelids, and that was the only thing I could move. It hurt for me to move my left arm. And I thought to myself, why does it hurt my back to move my left arm? That's weird. And then I tried to move my left leg and I screamed. I tried to stand up and I immediately fell over onto the ground. Remember how I said the previous night, the pain that I felt was the worst pain that I had ever felt in my life? The worst day of your life so far. We've got a new champion now. I didn't even know it was possible to feel that much pain so intensely. I quickly found out that even with crutches, I could only be in an upright position, whether standing or sitting, for about 15 seconds before I had to either lay down on my back or just throw myself on the floor. So you might be thinking to yourself, wait, if you can only sit up for 15 seconds at a time, how did you poop? You wanna know how I pooped? Oh boy. I did it in a similar way you would do in a hospital for a trauma patient who can't stand or sit or move. I'd have to lay down on the floor, put a chucks pad. A chucks pad is like a human sized puppy pad. And I would then have to poop on the floor and then clean myself with baby wipes. Super cool, right? So don't come at me telling me your back pain was stronger than mine or more intense. Were you pooping on the floor? Didn't think so. I realized very quickly that I was not going to live like this. And I had to do something about it immediately. So that's what I did. On day four after the injury, I went and got an MRI. And it turns out I had the most common type of lower back injury, a herniated disc, two of them, L4 to L5 and L5 to S1. And if you have severe lower back pain, it's almost always this exact type of injury. You might not have two of them. You might only have one herniated disc, either L4, L5 or L5, S1, but most likely 
that's what you have. Now, herniated discs will usually heal on their own over time. But remember, I was pooping on the floor. So I went and got an epidural. Yes, the same epidural that they give women when they are giving birth. The epidural that I got was under fluoroscopy, which is like a uh, video motion x-ray where an anesthesiologist, he numbs the area first and then puts progressively bigger and bigger needles and he's watching on this computer monitor and watching the needle go in until he gets to the nerve that is being effective and they put a uh, medication. I think it's called Buvacaine. I don't know, we'll put it on screen. And this medication basically numbs that, uh, that area, helps prevent that pain signal from getting sent, you know, from your body to your brain and back for about three months. I know this procedure sounds terrible, but I did not feel the slightest bit of pain during the procedure. And I went from basically crawling in that office where I was laying down on the floor at the office, I was able to walk out 20 minutes after the procedure was over. Now I knew this would buy me three months of relief from the acute pain. So I could do all the exercises that I needed to do to heal from this acute injury. So I did the exercises that I was supposed to do. And after three months, when the medication wore off, I didn't have that horrible, intense, severe, acute pain. Yippee! I'm ready to start lifting again and ready to start strengthening my body. Because remember, you can only fight weakness with strength. But then I hit another problem. Remember how I told you this injury happened in 2019? Well, actually it happened in November of 2019. And so three months after November 2019 would be February of 2020. Now you may have a hazy recollection of a An unspecified virus of unknown origin circling the globe right about that time. I got literally one fucking day in the gym before all the gyms were closed. This was the absolute worst possible thing that could have happened for my rehab because now my whole body and my whole support system that I need to help retrain this injury so I could go back to normal, it's just gonna keep getting weaker. I have no way to strength train, no way to build back up the strength that I had previously. It's just gonna get weaker and weaker and I'm gonna lose more and more stability and that's exactly what happened. So eventually the gyms opened back up but the damage was Done. Over the entirety of those four years, I would aggravate my back doing seemingly mundane stuff like brushing my teeth, tying my shoes, or sneezing. That's right, sneezing. And then I'd be in incredible pain for a week or more at a time. Not quite that nine and a half out of 10 pooping on the floor pain, but like five or six pain that makes it really difficult to, you know, work or be at happy, healthy human. Sitting and playing drums for any length of time was impossible. Half of my left leg was completely numb, which made playing double bass extremely difficult and thus thwarting my brilliant plans of replacing Jay Weinberg and Slipknot. I couldn't reliably track drums, thus making my turnaround times exponentially longer because I couldn't play drums two days in a row. My studio career basically came to a grinding fucking halt. Does any of this sound familiar to you? For those of you who don't know, you wouldn't believe the number of people that have had to crawl into a doctor's office, PT's office, a chiropractor, or a ART practitioner's office because they sneezed and tweaked their back. It's freaking wild and it happens all the time, just from sneezing. And it seemed like these tweaks in my back, you know, that would hurt like hell for a week or longer, it seemed to be happening more often and the pain was getting longer and stronger. Giggity. But why? Why were things getting worse over time? Had I re-injured my back? No. Follow-up MRIs showed that the herniation had completely healed. There was nothing physically wrong with me. The answer is your ticket to freedom, your path to being able to live a let's say mostly pain-free life. By learning the causes of chronic back pain and a new protocol for treating it, I saved my music career. And it all took less 
than three months. And everything I've learned in that time, I'm gonna teach to you right now. Back pain is ubiquitous in modern life. People from all walks of life, whether they're construction workers, nurses, doctors, lawyers, and of course, mixing engineers and musicians, all suffer from chronic back pain. From mildly annoying to absolutely crippling. But no matter your current lifestyle, you can fix it you can recover and go back to leading a normal life. There has been a recent revolution in the treatment of pain, evidence-based, and it has completely changed the way we think about pain, treat it, and recover from it. And this revolution has a name, Gradual Exposure Therapy. Gradual Exposure Therapy, or Graded Exposure Therapy, will only work for you if you understand the principles involved and the thought process behind the protocol. Quick disclaimer, in this video, I'll be specifically addressing back pain because it is the most complicated and tends to involve many other areas such as your shoulders and your hips and your knees. But the principles and the thought process that I'm gonna teach you behind this protocol will work for any type of chronic injury. A big problem is that most people don't wanna take the time to learn about their body and learn about the processes happening within it. They say things like, I don't wanna learn all that stuff. Just tell me what to do, bruh. But I'm telling you, if you don't understand the why of this protocol, it makes it impossible to do correctly and it will not work for you. The reason is because you have to pay very close attention to your body in order for this protocol to work. So what is it? Why do so many people from all walks of life all over the world, why do they seem to suffer from the same chronic back pain? most specifically lower back pain. Why all over the world are these people experiencing the exact same types of pain and injuries over and over and over again? The answer is pretty simple. It's something you've probably already done today. In fact, you're probably doing it right now. If you wanna fix your pain, there's three main important things that you need to understand that I'm gonna teach you in this video. One, acute versus chronic pain. Two, the cause of your specific type of pain. Is it trauma or is it repetitive stress, etc.? And three, which is the most important thing I can teach you today, is the reason why chronic pain gets worse over time and not better. If you can understand these three things, then the protocol for healing is actually pretty simple. And I'm gonna explain them to you all right now. So buckle up. Acute versus chronic pain. This one's pretty simple. Acute pain is defined as a pain that has lasted for one second up to six months of time, and it usually has an obvious treatable cause. Chronic pain is when you have intermittent or continuous pain that has been lasting for longer than six months. And that doesn't mean that you're in pain every single second of those six months. If you wake up every morning for the last year and your knee hurts like hell when you wake up, that is chronic pain. And a tool that is used all over the world is the zero out of 10 pain scale. Zero out of 10 obviously means no pain whatsoever. 10 out of 10 pain is the most incredible pain you could ever imagine feeling in your entire life. Understanding this pain scale is of the utmost importance in the treatment protocol that I'm gonna teach you today. You have to become very comfortable with being able to rate the intensity of your pain on the scale from zero to 10. The cause, why do you have back pain? There's two main reasons for back pain. The first is trauma. And we all kind of intuitively understand trauma. You've been in multiple car accidents or you fell off a roof that hurt. or you fell off a ladder or you got hit by a bike while riding down the street to go get tacos or you got baptized in a sporting event, you know, contact sports and yes, all of these things have happened to me. Basically anything that is sudden and involves force is considered trauma. And the second is sitting, that thing that we're all doing all the time. In the absence of a traumatic event, sitting is the main reason that our backs hurt all the time. That's why people in all walks of life from all over the world, why this chronic lower back pain is so ubiquitous. Say for example, you had a recent traumatic event and now you're resting and you're sitting all the time or more than you do normal. Well, now you're just adding, you're just compiling onto that traumatic event with something chronic. Why do so many musicians report having the exact same back pain from mild to moderate 
to annoying, to severe, to some career ending? The answer is of course, sitting. And I'm gonna demonstrate this with an Oreo cookie. This Oreo cookie is a great way to demonstrate how your back is structured. You've got a vertebrae on top, you've got one on bottom, and then you have the disc, which is the cream filling in the middle. Now my monitor is that way. So you can imagine me facing this way and always leaning forward when we sit. N nobody ever sits up straight like, um, like some freaking psychopath. We all lean forward. So you're spending years putting more pressure this way on this part of your disc, compressing this, until eventually what happens is you put too much pressure and now the cream starts to come out the back. That's where the nerves are and that is that severe lower back pain. That is that herniated disc. Sometimes the disc ruptures, which is a whole nother thing. They have classifications for what is considered herniated versus ruptured. I'm not gonna get into that. It gets very technical. But just understand from spending years of putting all of your weight coming forward this way and not doing anything to teach your body to move in the other direction. How many back bends do you do? None. How many arch body holds have you done in the last week? Yeah, that's what I thought. That's why this happens. That's why it's so common all over the world. No matter our professions, no matter our socioeconomic status, we're sitting all the time. You have to sit to drive to work. Sit at your desk when you're at work. I'm a drummer. I have to sit to play drums. We sit at our couch to watch TV. We sit while we're on the toilet. We're always sitting and we're always putting ourselves in this compromised position that just makes everything worse over time. Guitarists almost always sit when they're not performing live. They're always hunched over in this uh, banana shaped position that's just terrible for our backs and wreaks havoc on our posture and all of the structures in our body. That banana shape is a terrible thing for our backs and all of the other things that we do outside of it, whether we walk and run and work out and all that does not diminish the effect that all this sitting has on our bodies and our backs. You have to actively do work that specifically counteracts all of the sitting that you do throughout the day. And then once you start having chronic back pain, and this brings me to the third need to know fact, is that chronic pain gets worse over time. It becomes more intense and more frequent the longer you have it. And the reason is myelination and recruitment. Remember the very first time you tried to play an instrument? Do you remember how uncoordinated you were? The first time that I played drums, I could not get my right hand, my left hand, and my right foot to all hit the drums at the same time. It seemed like an impossible task. But over time, with practice, the coordination appeared. What's happening is myelination and recruitment. Our brains communicate to our body via nerves. The central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord, and then the peripheral nervous system, which is all the stuff on the periphery. All these nerves have a coating slash insulation on them that is called the myelin sheath. When you do something over and over again, your body says, hey, I should get better at doing this. When you do something over and over again, your body adapts by recruiting more muscles, recruitment, and also makes that myelin sheath thicker. The myelin sheath, when it thickens, it allows the signals to be transmitted back and forth between your body. So your body gives a command to your body and then your brain gets to know where your body is in space based on the signals that your body sends back. The faster this happens, the faster you move, the more you can practice, the more you play, the more myelination and recruitment improves, the better you get, the faster you move, the easier it is to move, and so on and so on. Now keep in mind, this is a hilarious oversimplification of what's happening in your body, but this is what you need to know. Well, guess what? You have special receptors called nociceptors, where their only job is to make you feel pain. And that entire pathway is experiencing myelination and recruitment as well. So the more pain that you experience and the longer you experience it, the faster and more intense your pain becomes because your body gets better and faster at sending the signal from your brain to your body and back. You are literally training yourself to be in more pain 
more often. That is why chronic pain gets worse over time. That's why it gets more intense over time. That's why the pain from even healed injuries tends to get worse, not better, even when there's no structural abnormality or deformity or actual injury anymore. If you've ever been to a doctor for pain and they tell you, there's nothing wrong with you, it's all in your head. The doctor is technically correct, but functionally wrong. Because when a doctor tells you it's all in your head, it sounds to you like he's saying, you're just imagining it and it's not real. And that's not what he's saying, or at least that's not what he should be saying. Because you're definitely feeling pain, but it's a result of the intense training that you've been doing to train your body to feel more pain more intensely for longer and longer periods of time. Even when doing things that have nothing to do with your original injury. It's like a positive feedback loop of feeling like ass, but not anymore. Now that you understand acute versus chronic pain and the zero out of 10 pain scale, the causes of back pain and why chronic pain gets worse over time, the protocol for recovery is pretty simple. If the problem is that your pain nerves are transmitting too intense of a signal too quickly back and forth between your brain and your body, then all you have to do is learn how to slow it down. Or put more intelligently, train your brain and your body to stop making you feel pain that is disproportionate to the activity that you're doing. And that is where gradual exposure therapy comes in. Gradual exposure therapy involves building strength and range of motion in your back as well as the rest of your body, but with one huge stipulation, three out of 10 back pain. You're gonna do various exercises under the stipulation that you only do them up to three out of 10 pain, and that's it. This is how you detrain the myelination and recruitment of those pain nerves and those pain receptors. As your nervous system learns that you can feel discomfort in that area without immediately overreacting into ball crushing 10 out of 10 pain, you untrain all that shit that your body has learned over this however long of a period that you've been having this problem. The guiding principle for any injury rehab, any exercise that you do, and there are many, there are lots of people that have very great programs, but the guiding principle of doing any of these exercises is that you get up to a three out of 10 pain and no more. If you're no longer able to do the movement and stay below a four, so at a three or less, if you can't do the movement without being at a three out of 10 pain or less, you stop. Try again tomorrow. This is a desensitization program, and the only way it works is if you stay below that threshold so you can desensitize that entire nervous system and so you can untrain this overreactive problem that you are having that you experience as crippling pain. For example, one of the exercises that I'm gonna teach you, the first, and I would argue the most important, is a Jefferson curl. A Jefferson curl starts where you're holding weight, so you're standing up straight, and as you go through the motion, the movement gets harder. And if you're only halfway through the motion and you start to experience more than three out of 10 pain, you just stop and come back up and see, okay, so maybe that was just bad for no reason. You, uh, If you do another rep, and you experience the same four out of 10 pain or more, well, guess what? That's all the range of motion that you're gonna be doing today. Or if you do another rep and now you're starting to experience more than that three out of 10 at an even smaller, a narrower range of motion, then just stop, go home, you're done for the day, try again tomorrow. I, I'm gonna keep Beating this into your head, the most important thing is this three out of 10 principle. That is the only way you are going to untrain the pain that you're having. Let's say we're doing Romanian deadlifts and you're not able to go down to do the full range of motion. You know, this is also a weighted exercise. If you're not able to go to do the full range of motion, stop, lighten the weight, make the weight lighter and try again. And if you're still not able to do the exercise with the full range of motion and stay below, you know, stay at a three out of 10 pain or less, just don't do it. Go home, try again tomorrow. When I started these three exercises that I'm gonna show you, 
I started with an unloaded bar, 45 pounds. Now there are a ton of great back exercises out there that you can do to increase your strength and mobility. But unfortunately, I really wasn't able to do most of them. The problem was that it was too difficult for me to stay within that three out of 10 pain range that I keep going on and on and on and on and on about. So I had to figure out three exercises where each exercise would first start from a rested position, became more difficult as the exercise progressed, and most importantly, if the pain increased too much that I was able to bail without exposing myself to further pain or injury. Because remember, three out of 10 pain is your guide. For example, a back squat was a terrible exercise for me. It's really hard to bail out of a back squat because you've got a bar on your back. If you've seen videos of how people have to bail out of a back squat, mm, yeah, no thanks. And I've never been good at doing back squats anyway, so that was out. Another fantastic exercise called the hyperextension, where you wedge your legs into this machine and you go down and then you bring yourself up. Great exercise for the back, but it was bad for me because I didn't have a way to catch myself. Say for example, I'm going down and all of a sudden the pain is too much and I need to stop. There was nothing that I could grab onto to help me back up. And I would literally just be stuck flopped over this machine with my ass sticking in the air. Uh, yes, that actually happened to me one time. I got like a spasm while I was doing it and I was stuck in this machine and I couldn't get my legs out from the apparatus that hooks you in there. I had to like roll and move and squeal and squirm. It was awful. So that one's out. So now here's the protocol that I've come up with. This protocol is divided into roughly two separate three month cycles. In the first three months, you'll only be doing three back exercises. The Jefferson curl, three sets, five reps. Each rep is five seconds down and five seconds up. The second exercise is the Romanian deadlift, three sets, eight reps. Each rep is five seconds down, five seconds up, nice and slow, nice and controlled. The third exercise is the conventional deadlift and it's three sets, eight reps, tempo doesn't matter, just don't Go crazy. The Jefferson curl is the primary exercise of this protocol. All of the pain relief, uh, increased uh, strength, increased range of motion, and general ability to live your life like a human, all of those benefits are coming from this exercise, the Jefferson curl. The other two exercises are just there to reinforce into your brain that it is okay for your body to move like a human through this range of motion. And we're doing them at such light weights that they won't cause a problem. When I started this protocol, I couldn't deadlift a toothpick. I couldn't pick up my dogs from the floor. I had to wait for them to jump onto the bed and then get them. Like I, I couldn't get down there. Putting on my shoes was a struggle. In a week, I was able to deadlift the empty bar with no problems and no pain. And another thing, I had had a persistent numbness on my left lower leg, you know, where your shin muscles are, and also the top of my left foot ever since I had this injury. In one week, it was gone, all just from doing the Jefferson curl. So I was waiting until I had a day that I wasn't feeling particularly great. Um, this morning, I had slept for about 16 hours, so I was just stiff from laying in bed for so long. So I'm standing to check my range of motion. I can make it a little past my knees, you know, about halfway down my shins. And uh, of course, uh, one of the dogs has to come up and say hello every time I'm anywhere near the ground. But now you can see where I'm at right when I woke up after sleeping for 16 hours. So after I've done my uh, morning range of motion test, you know, so I'm not feeling so great, I'm gonna make myself some coffee. I'm gonna take the dogs to the park and this is where I'm gonna do my 10 minute morning walk. The main thing about the 10 minute morning walk is it just kind of like get your body moving a little, getting it ready to be doing the exercises that you're gonna do for the day. But see, I'm kind of walking and just like swinging my arms a lot more. That's a very key point and walking briskly. So we're gonna do that for 10 minutes. So the first exercise is the uh, Jefferson curl. I'm gonna put links in the descriptions to people who describe these way better than I do, but the main idea of this Jefferson curl, right? So you're starting from the top and you're curling 
you're trying to curl down one vertebrae at a time. So you're getting a stretch. Uh, you're using the weight is kind of being your resistant to help you stretch out and just kind of getting your body desensitized and being not so cranky from all that sleep I was getting. Now you'll notice I'm not doing a great job of curling my back here. So if I were to pause it right here, I'm not really getting the quite curl that I want. Like I'm, I'm not able to reach the floor here. As you can see, I'm standing on something because I know that by the time I get to my third set, I will be easily touching the ground while standing on this. Like that's how well this exercise works, right? So, so what always happens is this, this first set, uh, I'm just not doing a great and that just, that seems to happen every time when I wake up and I'm just real stiff and sore. On my second set of the Jefferson Curl, remember I'm trying to go five seconds down and five seconds up. I'm already feeling better. I'm already getting a little more range of motion. I'm already getting a little more of this uh, flexion stretch that I want, you know, on here, which is the part that's gonna help, which is gonna give me the range of motion, which is gonna help loosen up those muscles. And it's already getting a lot better on my second set, you know, three sets in. See, I'm already almost touching the ground here. And now watch how much smoother this third set is. I watch, watch how much better my, my range of motion is. Watch how good I'm able to curl, right? I'm able to get the, uh, the weight all the way to, to the ground, no problem. I'm not feeling any pain or discomfort on this third set. All I'm feeling is like with each rep, I'm like, ah, oh, it's feeling really relaxed. My uh, body feels good. I feel the blood pumping. But uh, at this point, whatever pain or discomfort I was feeling is completely gone. This was my range of motion on the first rep of the first set. And here's my range of motion on the ground. Notice how on the first rep of the first set, my legs aren't nearly as straight and I can only reach down to here. Now on the last rep of the third set, my legs are much straighter and I'm still being able to get the weight touching the ground and I'm feeling absolutely no pain. Remember that's extremely important. Three out of 10 pain is your guide. That's why I didn't push it on this first set here, right? Because I didn't want to go over that three out of 10 pain because it was still feeling sore. It was still feeling stiff. And now by this third set, absolutely no pain and my range of motion is already vastly improved. Then next up, the Romanian deadlift. This is kind of a stiff legged deadlift. I'm, I'm standing on the ground. I'm not standing with my feet elevated. And the main thing that I'm thinking about when I'm doing this exercise is to stick my butt straight back, right? That's kind of the idea. Basically the idea is to go straight back, get the bar a little below my knees and then come back up. And the idea is just now that I've gained that range of motion from doing the Jefferson curls, that now I'm just reinforcing to my brain and my body that I can move in this range of motion without, without hurting myself and without pain. And I'll tell you, I'm probably feeling about a, like a one to maybe two out of 10 pain when I'm doing the RDLs at the very bottom, and that's about where, where I stop. It doesn't quite even get to a three. So three sets of eight reps with a nice slow tempo, and then after that, I'm doing a conventional deadlift. Now remember, I'm doing all three of these exercises with the same weight. This is 135 pounds that I've used for all three of them. Remember, you guys are gonna start with 45 pounds. That's it, okay? And the tempo on this one, I feel doesn't matter. It's It's, very easy, like it's no stress on me at all. And again, it is just reinforcing that I can move through this range of motion without having something go spectacularly wrong. And again, I'll do three sets of eight of this and then that is done. So after I've done that, now I'm gonna show you how much my range of motion has improved. So look at this. So this is my range of motion retest. So look. I'm able to get, think of it as like, I could basically get a second knuckle down on the floor. Whereas if we went back to my original range of motion test, look at that. Look how much more range, see I was here. I was here when I did it the first time. You see that? And now I'm down here. I have no stiffness, no soreness. I feel great and I'm ready to take on the day. For the first week, you're doing all three of these exercises with 45 pounds. 
that means you're using an empty Olympic bar. You can use a curl bar with some weight on it. You could use two 20 pound dumbbells or a 45 pound kettlebell. But anything where it's one piece of equipment rather than two, like, you know, we're having two dumbbells, where it's one piece of equipment like an Olympic bar kettlebell or curl bell is preferred. Now, if you're laughing at the thought of doing a deadlift with an empty Olympic bar, please, 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 for the love of God, just do these exercises as prescribed with 45 pounds only for the first week. Most of you will get a stimulus from doing the Jefferson curls just at 45 pounds. It's also a good time to learn how to do the movement. The movement is not intuitive. You have to learn how to do it. So it's much better to learn it at a very light weight than at a way too heavy weight and then wreck yourself. And then doing the RDLs and the conventional deadlifts are just reinforcing to your brain and your body that it is okay to move like a human through that range of motion without freaking out and causing you a bunch of agonizing pain. When should you increase the weight? You should increase the weight when you are no longer feeling any stimulus from all three of the exercises. And you did them for an entire week and you're feeling no stimulus, that is the time to increase the weight by 10 pounds. That's it. Then go another week before increasing the weight again. You should be able to increase the weight by 10 pounds every single week. And remember, you're doing all three exercises with the same weight. If you're doing 55 with the Jefferson curls, you're doing 55 with the RDLs and 55 with the conventional deadlifts. Remember, at this section of the protocol, you are training your brain and your nervous system more than you are training your muscles. And you're also training that range of motion. So it is very important to increase the weight slowly. This cycle is complete when you are able to do all three exercises at 135 pounds at the prescribed tempo. When you can do all three of those at 135 pounds, you are done with the first cycle. And that means that you are doing this weight and you are having no stimulus and more importantly, no pain. So even now, now that I've been doing this for about eight months, usually my first set of Jefferson curls, I'll feel not really pain, maybe one out of 10 or so. It's more just stiffness. But by the third set of my Jefferson curl, I'm moving completely pain-free all the way down, all the way up. My range of motion is great and all the stiffness is gone, all the soreness from you know sleeping 20 hours a night, all that's gone, I feel great. When you were at that point, that's when you'll know it's time to move on to the next cycle. One thing to keep in mind is that unless you are a really big dude, you know, if you're like 200 pounds or more, you know, or, you know, say about 100 kilos for you Europeans, if you are that big, then maybe you could increase the Jefferson curl to maybe 155 pounds, but max. But for the rest of us that are not super huge, you will never go over 135 pounds for the Jefferson curl. If you wish, you could do more reps per set, but don't go over 135 pounds. The literature seems to suggest that there is no added benefit from doing more and more weight with the Jefferson curl. Now the second cycle, the weight on the Jefferson curl, again, remains the same, 135 pounds, same rep scheme and sets. Three sets, five reps, five seconds down, five seconds up. But now you can start adding weight to the Romanian deadlift and to the conventional deadlift, however you see fit. As long as you're still using the three out of 10 pain as your guide. There are no real rules here on how to increase the weight on the RDLs and the conventional deadlift. Some people like me like doing really heavy deadlifts and that's fine. But I would caution you to not increase the weight by more than 10 pounds in any given week. Because remember, we are training your brain and your nervous system. But now we can focus a bit more on stability and strength. Just for God's sakes, increase the weight slowly, please. So after three months of doing this second cycle where you've been able to increase the weight on the RDLs and the conventional deadlifts using the three out of 10 pain as your guide. After three months of this, you're gonna be feeling pretty good about yourself. Your body's gonna be feeling good. Your flexibility is gonna be probably where it's never been before. 
your back is gonna feel good. You might wake up stiff on some days, but you do your exercises and you're feeling pretty great. Fantastic. At this point is the time when you can finally start doing all of the other supplemental exercises for your strength, range of motion, mobility. You can start doing dynamic movements and all of these other things that you should have been doing a long time ago and would have prevented you from being in this terrible mess that you find yourself in today. And there are tons of great programs out there, such as Low Back Ability. Found him on Instagram a while ago. He has a ton of really great exercises and he structures them very well. The main thing is I didn't like the very first exercises that he started out with. Like I couldn't, I couldn't do most of them, which is why I'm saying you wouldn't start a program like this until you've done this six months of this protocol that I'm showing you. Another great one is called Back in Motion by Steffi Cohen. She's this little 25 time like world record power lifter. She had a catastrophic back injury and came back from it. And that's how she wrote her entire program, Back in Motion. Another great one is Dr. Lane Norton. He has a ton of valuable resources. He is extremely smart in all things, uh, training, uh, fitness, and health. He is a fantastic follow on Instagram and on YouTube. If you are not subscribed to him, you absolutely should. He is pretty much the most knowledgeable person in this space. I actually first heard of this entire concept of gradual exposure therapy from Dr. Norton and from Dr. Cohen, I think in the same week, but follow them on the socials and when they speak, listen. Lane, Steffi, if you're out there, thank you so much for getting this information out. It has literally changed my life and I cannot thank you enough. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now I should mention that progress isn't always linear. For example, when I started this program, I did 45 pounds for the first week, 55 pounds the second week, so on and so on until I got to 95 pounds. And when I got to 95 pounds, I stayed at 95 pounds for about two months. It took two solid months before I finally wasn't feeling any stimulus from doing 95 pounds. And a curious thing happened. When I finally got to the point where I wasn't feeling stimulus from doing 95 pounds, my back felt great. Like I wasn't having any pain. I wasn't having stiffness. That was the point when it really felt like, like I'm, I'm fucking back, baby. I'm fucking back, right? And then I still took the time. Like each week after that, you know, I moved up 10 pounds until I got to 135. And then when I was able to do 135, I was like, okay, the first cycle is done. So just keep in mind that progress isn't always linear and always use three out of 10 pain as your guide, not some arbitrary weight that you're putting on the bar. That's not the point. Remember you're training your brain and your nervous system to not freak out when you're trying to move like a human being. Now who shouldn't do this protocol? This is a big topic, but in general, if you have some kind of unstable injury, if you've got bone chips, uh, bone spurs, something is loose and clanking around in your body, get proper surgery and have it removed. You can't just have body parts swimming around in you all willy nilly. That's freaking ridiculous. The pain clock is ticking and myelination and recruitment are working against you. The longer you wait, the more pain you're gonna be in, the longer that pain is gonna be, the longer it's gonna take you to rehab from it, to detrain your brain and your body. If you don't know what's wrong with you, get an MRI. The cash price for an MRI here in San Diego, 10 miles from my house, is 400 bucks. Yes, that's right. Even in the US, where we have the most expensive healthcare system in the world, it's $400 to find out what's wrong with you. Now, another thing that comes up is, what if you have insurance and your doctor doesn't want to order it for you? Maybe he's just telling you to go to physical therapy. Here's exactly what to say at your next doctor's appointment. I am consistently having seven out of 10 pain. It is affecting my life, it is affecting my work, and it's affecting my ability to feed myself and my family. I really think something is structurally wrong with me and I want to get an MRI. If you won't order an MRI for me, I'll go get it myself and pay cash. The cash price is only 400 bucks. It's happening either way. I promise you, he'll order it for you. And if by some wacky stretch, he doesn't, you can get a uh, doctor friend 
or a nurse practitioner, you can have them order it for you. And then you should also immediately change doctors to one that doesn't suck ass. I had a nurse friend that had knee problems. She worked in the uh, CVICU with me. She had a left knee problem and one day it just became really unstable. She said it was hurting tremendously. She went to her doctor and her doctor was like, oh, it's fine. You don't need anything. We're just gonna send you to physical therapy. So she calls me and she tells me what happened and I was like, uh, 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 no, 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 no. You go right back there and I had her tell him exactly what I just told you. So of course, he ordered the MRI and guess what? Completely torn MCL, partially torn PCL and a torn meniscus. She went for surgery two days later, six months of physical therapy. And the doctor was just gonna send her to PT without the surgery. That would have been even more catastrophic. So you always have to be an advocate for yourself because unfortunately, nobody else is gonna do it for you. Also, if you're having knee problems and it feels like a chronic thing, you know, it's been getting worse over time. Like for example, you drummers that have been doing the pressure swivel technique like a freaking jackass for years and now your knee's all messed up, the knees over toes guy is the authority on knee pain. His channel is fantastic and he has so many resources, so many exercises that you can start doing to immediately clear up your knee pain. Again, as long as there isn't something horribly wrong with it, as long as you haven't torn a bunch of ligaments and tendons in your knee from doing pressure swivel like a jackass. Also, another thought, don't do pressure swivel. I cannot fathom of a better way to grind your knee into a fine talcum powder than to apply pressure to your leg and then grind your foot back and forth. That is without a doubt the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And we all wanna do swivel because it looks cool and it makes you go really fast. You need to learn how to do it the James Payne method. James Payne is the authority on how to do the swivel correctly without destroying your knees. Do it right or suffer the consequences. And there's tons more resources for all different types of uh, specific uh, pain and nagging injuries that you can do that will dramatically improve your quality of life. Just remember to always keep that three out of 10 pain as your guide at all times. And also if you're already working with a doctor and he's not dismissive or he's not a dumbass, most doctors aren't. Most doctors really want you to get better. But uh, the reason why that happens is for a whole nother video. If you are working with a doctor, I'm going to make a separate unlisted video. I'll put the link in the comments. And this video will be something that you can show to your doctor. I will explain it quickly and succinctly exactly how this protocol works and what it's trying to achieve. And I'll use proper medical terminology so he doesn't think I'm a dumbass. And most importantly, it'll be short. It'll be three, maybe four minutes tops. And you can show it to your doctor and they'll be like, hey, do you think this would be good for me? or rather ask him, can you think of any good reason why I shouldn't do this? That link will be in the comments. And that's it. Thank you for watching. I hope that you guys uh, learned something. If you've got any other questions, you can toss them in the comments. If you wanna learn about some other injuries, uh, I think a good one would be like a carpal tunnel and repetitive stress, those type of injuries in the wrist because they are actually shockingly easy to fix. And if you'd like me to make a video on that, let me know in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day.